It gives me great pleasure to introduce Paul Holder. Paul has started as a teacher, I understand. Is that right? I started as a footballer and then... And then got into teaching. Yeah. And, well, then, yeah. and then went back. And then went to uh, Crystal Palace. And you were involved with the academy with Crystal Palace before taking on a full-time position there. Then you went on to, as I understand, to uh, help with the David Beckham Academy. I um, opened the one in Los Angeles. Right. And the uh, one in London. And... Hollywood. Then, and you were doing some work with the FA before taking a full-time post with the FA, now responsible for the development of under-12s to under-16s within the FA uh, setup. We all know the difficulties with, uh, with, with, with football. We all know that you know, it's, it's generally full of ego and a lot of money. Uh, but with that comes, an, again, enormous challenges for those coaches working with footballers. Having spoken to Paul a few times on the phone, what, what inspires me about what Paul's going to say is that he wants to change things. He has a different approach. He has an exciting, different way of taking on some of these challenges. And that's why today it, uh, you know, it gives a great pleasure to introduce Paul uh, so that we maybe can learn some of the different ways that the FA are approaching things. So without further ado, Paul, thank you very much. I suspect that might not be so uh, vociferous at the end. <laughs> nice to be called a VIP. Let's hope it's not all right for again. That's fine. Um, what the hell am I doing here? Sitting in front of, no, no, I should be standing in front of people who have infinitely more knowledge coming this way than going that way. What I have got is quite a bizarre <coughs> pathway to get where I, where I am. <laughs> Quite a bizarre pathway to get where I am. I, I look at that slide, I, you know, PowerPoint, what is it? It should evoke, you know, we, we rely on it too much to become our friend. You know, it's a bit like the television, you know, you're locked into that. But I'd rather you're locked into what I say. And if, if, I, if I see you looking at that, I know I'm talking tosh. That's fair enough. I don't I think that that, that that actually represents the country. We pray for success. We declare our allegiance to the flag. And then we'll go to a country and put another flag in and say, that's our country. That, for me, is English football at the moment. It's about that. Actually, there's normally a less on the end of that. But that's normally hopeless or design. But that's not fair. That's not fair at all. I've got, I don't know if you marched in on that video thingy of top international players. There's one Englishman, one Argentinian, a couple of Spaniards, bless them, a Swiss setter half, who shouldn't be there in the first place and a few others from other nationalities. But there is an Englishman in there, and that Englishman is Wayne Rooney. Not one, one's the tabloids absolutely love, and that the FA is slightly embarrassed about because of that. However, he's in there amongst the best. Now I'm gonna try and articulate something, being from the middle of London, that might be quite difficult. So I'm going to try and take you through uh, my ideas, and they're not in order. They're random. They're random ideas. They're things that I think work. And I, I, I'll tell you why I think they work. Because I've seen the best, and I've worked with the best. And I've worked with the best in David Beckham. And I've challenged him and asked him, and I wouldn't let him off his shirt tails. Because I want to know why and how he got to where he did. Then I talked to Eric Harrison. Does anyone know Eric Harrison? Not George Harrison, Eric Harrison. Eric Harrison was David Beckham's coach when he was at Manchester United. Now I know Eric very well through the link between the Beckham Academy. So I know how David performed. And I know what's in what was in David in order to get him to where he was. And it's nothing to do with football. Nothing. 
We have spent our entire time wondering whether we can next produce the next super athlete. And I, maybe if you're not into football, and I suspect from the audience you come from different sports. Okay. <coughs> That's not a problem, you can transfer across. Because when I talk to the people from the RFU, they've got the same problem. And people from English cricket, they've got the same problem. I spoke to Peter Moores perhaps two days ago, who was the England, he was the England manager at one time, so he had a row with Kevin Peterson. There's a big issue in cricket which follows the same pattern as in football, which is the same pattern in rugby. And they have a problem of identity. I don't know who they are. Oh, we're English. Put the cross on there and that makes us English. Well, unfortunately, that's not enough. Because what I do now is I go around the professional clubs telling the coaches that it's really not a good idea to work the way you're working because you will produce average. <clears throat> and if you want to produce average, get out of the academy system and stop calling yourself a professional coach. Professional coach implies you get paid, which means you're an employer. And you are hell heralded as the professional. Yet, you have no idea about these three groupings that happen at any one time in your coaching session. And this is simple, Look, the graphics are rubbish, but you can understand the issue I'm telling you. This is the country at the moment, in my humble opinion, and I would, people can go, wait, 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 I'm not having that, and all that stuff. Yes, I'm happy with that, I can argue that. So feel free to talk to me about this. But, in this country, and I know this because of my school teaching years, we are absolutely terrific at kids who are striving to keep up. Our special needs work is the best in the universe, in my opinion. Because my child has learning difficulties. And I know yeah, that we have got the best provision for that. It can be better, I know that. And average, fine. We know what average is, but we're happy with average. And you know what? We say average isn't average, it's great. And I hear these terms all the time in, in, in when I go around football. They're doing things and they're saying, oh, that was great. I said, no, 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 it's not great. It was average. That's not great. You expect that. That's not greatness. That is just doing what you expect them to do. If you want great, you set your standards to greatness. Oh, this is a centre of excellence. No, it isn't. It's a centre of average. It isn't a centre of excellence. Why? Because we have got foreigners coming out of our ears in the English game. Now, actually, I'm an eco economist as well. And I was a head of economics at school until they found out. Yeah? <laughs> and the fact is, I know that the economics, we've got an importing culture. We import rather than we export. But why don't we export talent? It can't all be salary. We don't export talent because we are producing average and calling it excellent, my opinion. However, we've got some excellent players who we think are average, and average players who definitely are not excellent. So, we work here, fantastic. When we get to this bit, who have special needs in themselves, we haven't got a Scooby-Doo. And that's the <coughs> slang for idea. We haven't got a clue what to do with these children. What's a child? Up to 21. It's bizarre because of someone, uh, current research is saying you can't, you know, you can't be responsible for your actions until you're in your 20s, 21, 22, 23, yet they can go in the army and shoot someone at 16, 17, it's a bit odd, isn't it? And so when we see children, and this is the problem with football, because of the economics, children are having a much shorter childhood. And we are impatient with them and we want them to be adults. And unfortunately, genetics has taken over and caused us the major problem because kids are bigger and stronger and look like an adult when they're 14. Yet that's all that nature's done. Because, go back, we've got 20 prehistoric, we've still got prehistoric ways of working 
yet we look like an adult. And the issue is with coaches, they can't get to grips with this at all. So what I'm going to do today is look at talent ID, what is great, what makes a great athlete, in my opinion, based on experience. I have, when I was at Crystal Palace, under very difficult circumstances, we have got, and I'll show you later, an extraordinary amount of people in professional football in one group, out of one group. And I'm convinced it's because of certain things. And I'll show you those certain things. I think you may not float your boat. You might think I'm right that. But there's three in the premiership out of one group. One group. And I think it's because of the way I worked with him. And I think it's because of the way we worked with them. And I think it's because we didn't have any resources. And I know that sounds peculiar. And I'll take you through the, the, the way it works. So this is where we are. So forging ahead of these guys. Now I'm dealing with the best. What do we do with the best? Not the average. And how do we know the difference? And you'll say, oh, Spain. <coughs> Spain. Let's all go to Spain, because football's wonderful, everything's wonderful there. Well, I'm very good friends, uh, I'll pick the name up, with the assistant manager at Real Madrid when Benitez was there. And he will stand here and say exactly the same as I'm saying about English football. It's nothing like it. It's in turmoil. But what they've got is a crop of very good players out of one club, which has a philosophy that rides roughshod over the rest of Spain because there's no other, no other club that exists like Barcelona. None. Nor will there be for the next 10 years. So you can virtually replace the Barcelona side in the next five years as the Spanish national side. Now that's peculiar because that doesn't mean Spanish football is great. It just means one club is doing fantastic work with them at the moment. And they're getting a cultural crop through. How do we achieve this, nature nurture? Who believes genetics? Who believe genetics is one of the key reasons why kids are get to the be the best? Anyone? Part of it. Part of it? How much percent? What percent? <coughs> Look, I know you, so I, no, you can't answer it. Why should you? Because no one knows. No one knows. The only thing you know is that nature and nurture equals perfect. And if you get those balance, if you get that balance right you're heading towards some great, great stuff. You're heading towards a great player. But there's problems on the way. Now what I'm going to do is you're going to have to hang on to your shirt tails a bit because you're going to go, oh, no, I don't know what talking about. But it will all fit into place where I'm coming from in the end. It might not go in any order because that's the way I work with kids. I don't go in any order. And it's because of that I believe that all these players have come through into professional greatness because I've left them to fend for themselves. And the key is, if you want to be an Olympic champion, you need to choose your parents very well. There is, a, there is a great argument that your parents, and professional clubs are doing this now, where they are measuring the wrists of goalkeepers and looking at that difference in that little plate there to see how big they're going to be. Great. That's only part of the thing. One player was released from a top professional club the other day. Do you know on what basis? Well, you'll never guess. Well, I'm going to tell you. And this was the exact words to this player. How big are your parents? He said, I don't know. They're very big to me because I'm only short. You know, they big. How big are your parents? <coughs> Next week, not going to be good enough. You're not ever going to be big enough. Professional football club looking for the best. Uh-oh, that's why pray with a cross across your face. Because that's what's happening in many professional environments in our national game and in rugby union. Don't get it wrong, <coughs> that in there. Not so much in cricket, but in rugby union it's the same. This is a big problem, you know. We have spent our entire time, that could be me by the way, with my daughter, it could be, it, we can't work, I can't work you out. And we've got these coaches in the country now 
When you think about it, there's 10,000 kids registered professional clubs between the ages of 9 to 16 in this country. Let's do the maths. How many of them are going to become elite? You don't know. That's a lot of kids. And we spent our entire time over the last 30 years, and I do coach education, last 30 years training coaches to look at the football and where it goes and what it does. And missing the key that they could never work out what's going on there. Well, what happens? Kids fall by the wayside. We're hemorrhaging talent. And I use this analogy, it's fairly rubbish, but I use it anyway. You turn your tap on at home, and the water comes flooding out. Always does in the mornings. But you've got no idea what you're losing under the ground. No idea until it bursts through and you have to shut the roads and it messes up your day. No idea what's hemorrhaging out below. And that's what football is. They ain't got a clue what's going. They know what's coming through because it's measurable. What they don't know is what's not coming through because you can't see it. Why? Because they get rid of the kids too early. Or they make judgments on them based on something like, and I'll give you a clue, this could be the England football team in the World Cup. You can squint your eyes a bit. <laughs> it was on the ground crying. The England team was booing loudly to the nation. I saw it. And I'll give you an example. What did the players do when Robert Green threw the ball in the goal? Pardon? And what did the manager do immediately afterwards? Push. <laughs> Dropped him. Got rid of him. Okay, at that level, might be okay. But the players, I watched the players, two of them turn and went like that. I watched an equivalent one to the Italian national side in the last World Cup when they won the World Cup. And when a player, one of the players got booked and was going to miss the next game, I've never seen anything like it. They jumped all over him. Jumped all over him. That he was crying and everything. When the goalkeeper made a mistake, they went round him. Funny, isn't it? How they won the World Cup. What happened to us? We were on the carpet. Booing. What happens? What did we think? And what happened at the national camp? Because I know. What was the discussions? We need to think about a practice you know, for the next game. How are we going to change our tactics? What tactics got to do with it? The biggest problem was nothing to do with football. The biggest problem was a social problem between the Northerners and the Southerners. Bring back the War of the Roses. Let's all have a fight. Put them another wall. And that's what it is. French national team, exactly, exactly the same. Technically, I speak... I'm shouting, I don't know why. Maybe I'm a rat. I speak... Oh, I've gone before. I'm off somewhere. I speak when they talk about the World Cup. I was talking to Stuart Pearce, and he said to me, and I was the day before yesterday, do you know what people think of the English players? I went, no. Nah. He said, they think we're really good. They think we've got technically brilliant players. So have the French. It's nothing to do with the football. It was to do with understanding these kids. That's the problem. Now, my, my view is this. Oh dear. My view is that if we do not change the way we view football and start looking at the people that are on the carpet and why they're there, or the people that are strutting their stuff and why they got their chin up and why they do all that business, we are wasting our time in coaching. Because coaching does not mean you can put a practice on. That's only a fraction of it. Yet the FA is just being filmed. Well, we might want to pause this bit, but I'll carry on. The yeah, FA. <laughs> I'll get the CV up today after. The, 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 the FA have continually trained us to look at the football. When you do your, all your courses, you're trained trip, to look at the football and practice. Sort of practice out for them. Oh, they were crap the other day. Sort of practice out for them. Well, his grandfather, uh, his grandfather's just passed away. Did you know that? He said, why Mr. Penalty? I said, it's probably a good reason. So practicing penalties might not be the thing he needs. And it's those sort of issues that are failed. We have failed the coaches miserably. 
So the Federation, oh bless them, are the ones responsible for the mess we're in. Not imported players, not Sky News, although, or Sky Sport. Not Lord Treesman, not not getting the Olympic bid. The fact that we have no idea, no idea, how to coach the individual. Now, if you're a tennis player in the audience, when you're doing individual sports, you can't get away from it. Because you're dealing with people's emotions all the time. And one word football can't stand is emotion or spiritual. They don't, that's not in their vocabulary. You are tough, and you are going on that field with mental toughness. Excuse me, I'm not, but I ain't going to show you. And I'll give you a prime example. Under 21 international, Crystal Palace first team, I will not give his name away, ever. Phones me up and says, I can't play. And I said, what, you forgot your boots? What, what's the issue? He can't play. I said, I can't play this game anymore. I said, what do you mean? He said, I'm useless. I said, you're not useless. He said, I'm useless. I've been dropped. I said, you've been, you're an England player. I said, I can't play. So I put him onto a psychologist. Yeah? The issues he's got is enormous. Going back yay into the Middle Ages when he was a kid and had expectations going back when he was six, seven, eight from being in an expectation that he was going to do things. When he crumbles, there's nothing there to support him. And the issue I have with him now is how many of them are around? We assume an awful lot about these talented people. Yet we, have, we if you wanted to be a coach, and I don't mean psychology, I mean if you wanted a coach and make, get the best out of the best, you need to understand the best. What have all these got in common? Now I put Johan Cruyff in there for the older people in the audience who was the master. Wayne Rooney, Johan Cruyff, Frank Lampard, Luis Suarez, Cesc Fabregas, Lionel Messi, it could be anyone. Six things they've got in common that makes them where they are today. My opinion. Based on research, by the way. I've read all the books, the big fat books and all that. Yeah, I've read all them, know that. Now it's application. Well, there's something significant trends that run alongside them. What one characteristic would you say occupies every one? It's not negotiable. Because I know how these learn their football. One? Anything? Anyone? Ambition. Will. Undaunted will. Is that, is that ambition? It's ambition, isn't it? You're going, no, no, it's not my ambition. Yeah, <laughs> what are you talking about? Get off. <laughs> Undaunted will, right? Undaunted strength, which is resilience. Undaunted thing in their ability, but not all the time. They're obsessive compulsive practices. You think Wayne Rooney's daft. He ain't daft. Never in a million years. Talk to Eric Harrison, he's bright as a button. But in his world, not news of the world, in these worlds, <laughs> right? When he's out of that world, he ain't what you think he is. He can't do that, because that's not his world. That's his world where he shows his intelligence. And he is highly, highly intelligent. And those of you who are experts in multiple intelligences will know far more than me about this sort of thing. Never ever think that these players are not intelligent. Now, the obsessive compulsive stuff leads into practice. They are obsessive compulsive practices. And if you've ever read the book, the book Bounce, about the table tennis players, yes, they were obsessive compulsive practices. There is not one person, I'll give you a copy of this if, if you want later, there's not one person who gets to that thing without being obsessive compulsive. I've got, I'll speak to Peter Moores, my godson plays cricket for Sussex, he's a wicket keeper. Played for England under 19. I said, why is he going to make it? First words, he's obsessive compulsive. And I said, I know. Because I used to have to bat balls back when he was doing table tennis. He was just bat, 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 bat. All the time. He's like that when he's playing cricket. So that's what they're like. Undaunted will, a clever eye and intelligent. 
Now you might say to me, intelligent? Uh, they're not intelligent. He falls by the wayside. But unless you understand that intelligence and understand that in his arena, he is, but, um, so let's talk to Wayne Rooney, he is really, really smart. Alex Ferguson will protect him to the nth degree up to one place. And that place is the grass. He will not protect him on the grass. Because he knows he can deal with it. What he can't deal with, what's the other side of it? When he steps on the grass, he's someone completely different. So when we look at intelligence, we think that some of these players, yes, and here's a bit of fun, we think that some of these players are not intelligent. No, you can't have that. We'll show it later. No, I won't. I'll show it now. Now, here's a very intelligent player, but he doesn't show it. The City team this evening, 20-year-old Mario Balotelli, who uh, City fans are hoping to see great things of. And, uh, what's your name for him, Robbie? What, 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 what's he doing with that, that there? What? He, he can't even get his... <laughs> I think I'm going to change his name to Mario Bibatelli. What is he doing? He can't get in the ball. He's trying hard. Look, he's trying hard. He's trying hard. He gets a ball, though. You need a bit of assistance sometimes. This is a set piece. <laughs> is this tonight? Is this tonight? Yeah. He's moving up for the game. He can't put, he can't put a bib off. Now you put your left arm in there and your right arm in there. You are joking me, you little. <laughs> There you go. It's smiley. Yeah, exactly. Humor. <laughs> See, there you go. Perfect. He doesn't like this bit. <laughs> if he wants a blue bit, that was the problem. He should have been a blue bit. So last week, he came off because he was allergic, had an allergic reaction <coughs> to grass. This week, he's got bivitis. <laughs> <laughs> So, be careful when you cast aspersions about intelligence because it's not necessarily what, what you think it is. Um, yeah, so here they are. I quite like that. I think that's a perfect thing that he can't do it, and literally can't do it. I'll tell you, lad, Manchester City say, you, you couldn't believe him. When he steps on, the, you might not see this bloke play, you might see an arrogant, he's 20 years old. He's being hammered by the press, Balotelli. He's only 20. He's a kid. And he's got kids' traits. If I saw a 20-year-old, what were you seeing one time, yeah? Walking down Southampton High Street, and he starts kicking a cola can, here goes 20. When Mark Bar Balotelli causes uproar on the pitch, you go, what's he doing? He's a footballer. Yeah, but he's 20. He's a kid. And what you see about these is this is what they're going, particularly this one here, Clever Eye, which governs their tactics. It's not a coincidence that the best players seem to be in the right place at the right time. That's to do with skill acquisition. If you don't know about skill acquisition, so there's books about this, fat about it. But basically, you get this, these characteristics. Essentially, to, to get to the top, and this is based on thing, uh, abilities, drive, opportunity, and that is most important of all. And that's what we haven't given our kids a support network. Because there are players, and this kid who's the under 21, needed a support network, not when he was 21, when he was 8, 9 and 10. And when you've got these people in academies, now picture this. Picture, I don't know if you've got kids or grandkids or, or you, you, you hire them at the weekends, I don't know what you do, but <laughs> if you've got eight, you take an eight year old who comes into an academy. When he comes into the academy, and I had this with the first team manager at Crystal Palace, it was about a 12 year old, and he said to me, he's immature. You know, I said, yeah, he's 12. And he went, no, no, he should be playing under 14. So I went, no, 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 no,
He went to Matt, he's in the football environment now. So I brought in his school book and I laid it on his desk and went away. And he came back and said, don't give me any primary school, school books about it. I went, no, that's the kid you're talking about. He can't spell Hammersmith. His writing isn't joined up. And do you know when he goes home, he gets a duck out in the bath. And he cuddles his mum and dad. And he cries. And you're telling me you're treating him like a 23-year-old who's resilient. Well, he ain't. And the problem is, we haven't trained that in our coaches yay until the middle ages when the first courses come out. We've said, put that practice on. And he goes to there, and he goes to there, and he goes to there, and he goes to there. He goes, well, he ain't going there. Why not? Because he's no feel like it, and he's got behavioural issues. Oh, get rid of him. And it's that sort of attitude. Uh, what's missing? And it is something we can't control. We can control that. What's the lesson? <coughs> what's missing? Luck. If you want to be a skier, don't be born in Amsterdam. There ain't any hills. No, oh, I can't ski. All right, then just run around on the flat. Too. If you want to be an actor, you're going to have to have luck. A whole lot of luck. But compare this, and I'll give you these people here. All of us do not have equal talent, but all of us should have equal opportunities to develop our talent. And that's JFK. And the problem is, opportunity is the key issue why we hemorrhage talent. Because we pick the big kids. And we pick the kids that can do now. And we say, he's going to be a player. I said, how do you know? I said, you've got kids. He went, yeah. I said, how old are they? He said, oh, one's 10 and one's 9. First team manager. And I said, how many A-levels are you going to get? And he said, don't be stupid. I said, well, you'll be. You started it. <laughs> how many A-levels are you going to get? What degrees are you going to get? I've got no idea. It's miles away. I said, exactly. Same with football. It's miles away. It's that difference. Yeah, not the same. So, right. <laughs> uh, Gary Neville. David Beckham. Who's he? Robbie Savage. Robbie Savage. Didn't know he played for Manchester United, did you? Nicky Butt. Casper. Don't care, don't care. Uh, Paul Scholes. And the best player, Keith Gillespie. Everyone thought Keith Gillespie was going to be the best player. Eric Harrison, the class of 1992 that slaughtered the youth system. And here's the key. What's the key to them, their greatness? Individual stuff, yes, but what do you think was the key thing? Because I spoke to Eric about it. And I spoke to, uh, he's not on that now, a lad called Davis who's uh, played in that team. He's not in there. Who's missing? Ryan Giggs. Don't know where he is in that one. Probably on the left wing out there. Now, what do you think the key issue for them getting to where they were? And this is something we miss in coaching all the time. And I don't, I, you don't get it in individual sports. It's the support network. And it's this. It's the fact that the group was stronger than the individuals. <coughs> and part of my coaching, and when I deal with coaches, is look at the group dynamics, work on the group dynamics, and they will do this for you. And these are Eric's words. We couldn't get them off the training field. They pulled each other up by the bootlaces. They were fiercely competitive with each other. They were grouped together as a group. And they pulled each other up by the bootlaces. And they pulled Paul Gillespie up by the bootlaces to become better than them. David Beckham was not the best player in that environment. But he was obsessive, compulsive, and in a group of t a team that was obsessive, compulsive. So if you're obsessive, compulsive as an individual, that's great, <coughs> but you've got to be in a group that's obsessive, compulsive. Because if you are, you'll go through the roof, which is exactly what I had at Crystal Palace. Exactly the same, except my players were better than me. <laughs> and he wrote a book and I... I've got to say it. So that sort of thing. And this will stagger you. Pick the player. Oh, I won't stagger you. That's a bit exaggerated. I won't stagger. Right. Anyone notice a face? Which one? There. 
Down there? Or there? <laughs> Who's that? Messi. Lionel Messi. Whoops. Big curve. There it is. Lionel Messi. Started his football career picking up stones while the game was going around him. I ain't playing. Then he got a ball in his fingers off and running. That's his story. The interesting one is not him. He ain't the interesting one. <clears throat> He's the interesting one. And it ain't him for, for confidentiality reasons. But there's a kid in there who's really interesting. Because he was better than Lionel Messi. The coach later wrote he had everything. Everything that Lionel Messi... And Lionel Messi was bugged about this. He was bugged. But this kid had everything. Except one thing. Anything? His parents were very supportive. His were drug addicts. Choose your parents well. And because of that, they couldn't get him to training, opportunity. What happened? He fell off the radar. What happened to him? No one knows. He is hemorrhaging under the water line. We do, he's one of those drips that come out into the grass. We don't know where he's gone. <coughs> now, could the coach have done anything about it? In those days, did they care? I'm not sure, and I'm not going to go into that realm because it's too deep. But what's important is the support network. How important is that? The two contrasting fortunes are ridiculous in terms of their outcome. Simply because the parents were supportive of one and off the rails on another. My story? Brian Clough sat me at Brighton. Great story, this. Sacked me at Brighton. He didn't know I had social problems. Real huge social problems. But it wasn't a thing you could have. It wasn't available then. You couldn't have it then. The reason I didn't kick to where I should have got, <coughs> and I say that now because in hindsight I'm going to be really bullish about this, because I should have got to the first division. Because they told me afterwards, you should have got to the first division. Why I didn't? It's because I had social issues. Huge social and psychological issues associated with adolescence. I was all over the shop, yet no one supported me through it. So what did I do? Went off the rails. And I haven't got back on them yet. <laughs> so on and so forth. And this is the key area for me, is whether you can see the difference between performance and potential. And the biggest issue in the country at the moment is we look above the waterline all the time. And if a kid performs badly, and I'll tell you a kid within the thing, we see the instant performance. Yet the idea is we need to see the potential that lies underneath. Because if you don't, you will crash into it. Or you won't see the whole picture of that iceberg. And it's very interesting that the problem we have in this country that we don't look further than the waterline is because we want to make judgments here and now. We want to go, he's, yes he's going to be, no he's not going to be. And that's coach arrogance, thinking I can predict, playing God, I think I can predict the future. You're never going to be a hit record for Beatles. Yes? You're never going to make the grade. You're never going to do this. Well, I'll tell you what, you best have a look at the person first and look at the kid holistically before and look at the potential that lies underneath. How do you measure potential? Opportunity is one thing. Who struggles with this? People born late in the year. You know the August birthday scenario? If you're born late in the year, yeah, 70% of kids in academies are born in September, October, November, December, and January. Why? Because they're big. Big and strong and fast. May, June, July, August, September might have the same potential, but they don't get the chance because they're little dots. Huge issue. Same in Spain. Czech Republic, they don't give a stuff. They do, it, they do it openly. Ice hockey team in the Czech Republic, the national ice hockey team in the Czech Republic, forgive my statistics is wrong, are September, October, November, December, every one of them. And they go, we want the biggest and the strongest. We're not interested in the little one. 
Wife's talent, we've got to look top down. These go over generations. How many? Five minutes. Platini, Budka, Zidane, Mendieta, Gerard, David Villa, what they all got in common. David Villa didn't go to an academy until he was 15. Platini did not train at Clairefontaine, which is their best academy. He didn't get into the system until late. All of them came into the system when they were late. What we've got to look at is not the end product, but how he went from there back to the ages and get into the end product from there, and that's the key. Fabregas, we look at Fabregas now. How old's Fabregas now? 23, 24? He's at his wealthiest. That's where he's at his top value. 24, then now he's looking at player. If we'd have judged Fabregas down now, probably not a good example because he was good, we may have made a completely and missed the chance for him to get there. We have to see the pathway. And I want to look at this very quickly. International debuts, World Cup 2006, they did not make their international debuts at 16, 17, 18. Those top players, Balak, made his international debut at 23, not at 17. So why judge players as, as, as elite athletes when they're early? Because they don't do it. Cannavaro, one of the best centre-backs in the world, didn't make his international debut until he was 25. Perla, who's outstanding with all these, Car Carvalho, I don't know the information. So the issue is whether we can be patient with the, with the guys. And here's something that will say, this is an athletics thing. If you judge a kid in athletics at 16 and try and predict at 23 what he's going to be like, that's the chance of success. 0.06. And athletics is pretty de predetermined. If you <coughs> judge him at 22, you probably, and you, you judge him at 22, and you say, this is what you're going to be like at 23, you've got a high chance of doing it. We are judging kids at nine. Nine. It's a negative figure. It's minus something. We don't need to judge, we've got to put in a system where we don't make judgments on them until later. Now, we're the best, you have to make judgments between some, but that's a staggering thing to do. <coughs> The biggest problem for me <coughs> is you look at these three here. I'll just go through this. He was mine, he was not mine. Ben Watson, Victor Moses, Wayne Routledge, all in the same group. Premiership, 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 gone to championship. Pathway completely different. No supportive parents. Reading age of six when he came to us at 15. This lad here, always a dribbler. This lad here couldn't dribble for topic but he can ask strike a football. He couldn't cross it, still can't, but he could get past anyone they like. <laughs> and the thing is, is you've got to treat them as individuals. If I put down a practice where there's a lot of cones for Victor Moses, he would have forgotten where to go after the first cone. Yet, we need that information and we need to treat the kids as in individuals because they come from completely different pathways. This is for me, clear vision, tangible goals and the right practice for these people. But most importantly, to see them as individuals. They all have characteristics that different. It is little use bumming them all in the practice and expecting them to all do the same, which is what we've done for the last 50 years. We have to look in the practice to see whether these individuals have issues associated with their individuality. And this is my coaching. <coughs> We can go two ways. We can work from outside to in and push information into them, which is what we've done on our coaching courses. I'm going to give you all the information, off you go. Do this, do this, do this, do this. Or they can, you can pull it out of them. So you work from inside to out. So they've got the knowledge and the information and you pull it out of them. For talented players, this is absolutely essential to work this way that you drag the talent out of them. Why? Because they'll, he'll, they'll then show you their individuality. If you push stuff into them, I'm pushing my stuff into them. I can't see their individuality. So what you end up doing is producing 
Then, clones. You end up producing the same people if you push your information in. If you drag it out of them by your coaching methods, you will see their individuality. Last little bit, because I, I, I always go on too long. The other thing is this. All the work must be relevant, real, and there needs to be repetition. The three R's. If you're doing a practice that isn't relevant for a talented player, it'll switch off. He'd go, I ain't doing that. He won't, he'll be honest, he won't do it sort of in, in terms of his body language, but he'll show you in performance that it's not relevant for me. So don't give a goalkeeper dribbling. Oh, good. He'd go, I've got my gloves on. I want to do some diving around and being moody. <laughs> and this is my key. And this is why I think England have failed. Because we're really nice. We're really lovely. Because we put a load on the kids, and when performance is still rising, we stop the practice. Why? Because some of the kids might be bored. Or they're tired. Oh, bless. You look puffed out. Have a rest. No. My thing is this, and I've noticed this in basketball, and I've noticed it particularly in the top, in the top Spanish countries. They take them far beyond when performance is dropping, and then they drive them on that extra 10 yards. Extra 10 minutes. Just when performance is tilting, because they're a bit fatigued mentally, the load's gone up. And what we do, we tend to do is stop here. There's a bit left, and you take them over the edge. And I think that's the difference between dealing with average and dealing with excellence. That you take them over the edge of their performance, and you drive them even harder. And people will say, you can't do that, get an overuse injury. Can't, can't do that, the kid's tired. So, what happens in the last bit of the game? He's fatigued. He's, no, 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 he's mentally can't cope. What happens if he's in a penalty shootout and he's, he's drained anyway, he's played extra time? Uh, excuse me. So that's where we work very much on, on elite stuff. Now, the thing is for me, and I want you to consider this, Two, two sides. What do you see? This one. Two sides. What do you see from that? Iniesta's passing, Zabi's passing, and Messi's passing. That's science and that's brilliant. But coaches actually regard that as the most important information. Do you know what? I need to know what's going on in his head. I need to know if he feels all right. I need to know what's going on socially. I need to know whether he's got any physical issues. They don't tell me anything. Tells me about passing, but for me as a coach, I'll go, very nice, very successful. Now, why were you successful? Or why didn't it happen for you today? What were the reasons? And so you build this reflection in. And it's this I want you to consider more than anything. This. In a kid's life, we've trained coaches to think that his life is like that. Calm. Everything's calm. So our coach practice, our challenges and feedback have all been the same. Yet my maelstrom happened there. My, I'm sorry, my, I had a period of calm there. This is me. In that maelstrom of adolescence, when your hormones and things are happening all over the place, the seas ruffle. And I had a period of calm there, and some kids have a period of calm. But the key issue for me is I had a maelstrom there. And no one sorted it out. No one. That was my maelstrom there. So when you look at kids, here, you are navigating your way through calm and stormy seas. When adolescence comes in, they're in the mire. Not all of them. There's growth spurts, there's women, there's iPods, there's shoes that don't fit, there's skateboarding, there's Britain's Got Talent, there's all this stuff. Here is a period of calm, but not for everybody. And for me, if you want to deal with the best, you have to deal with, you have to coach, 
sort the practice out, sort the challenge out, and particularly sort your feedback out at times of maelstrom rough seas and at times of calm. And do you know the problem? We've never trained them to look at it because they don't know when it's calm and when it's rough. They either think it's all rough or they think it's all calm. Or when it is rough, they go, oh, I don't know what to do with that. How do I navigate my way through that? It's our job to give them skills to do that. That's my story. That period of calm, amongst all the things, took me to the next stage. But it was that that stopped me being a top professional. That. And no one was there. The coach didn't have a clue. Just assumed I was just a little sh... Yeah, just assumed I was a little nightmare. <clears throat> okay. I'm done. Uh, there's a lot more, but I've run out of time. My message to you is, 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 is this, and it's probably not, I don't know if it's a strong message or not, is the way I coach, the way I work, is very much at the end of, why, why did you do that? To build resourceful, reflective and resilient footballers and coaches now. And in order to do that, I have to have a firm understanding of these, these things in front of me. They can't lie on the carpet and cry, and I'm going, I don't know what to do with you. It is, that is the problem. And I think the difference between us and foreign coaches, and I look at this carefully, is that when I went to visit a club down in, in, in Spain, all the coaches had a degree in child development. All the ones I saw at Valencia, all were at Barcelona University. Ours do a seven day course or a two week course in football. They do the football but they do the child development as well. And it's not surprising they can deal with the issues. Now Spain hasn't got the issues the kids have and urban kids haven't got the issues rural kids have and rich kids haven't got the issues and all that stuff that goes with it. But it's up for a coach that if you want to make the best out of the best you're going to have to change the way you view coaching. And if you think it's pumping a football up and putting cones down you're in the wrong business because that's the last thing. Because if it was that, we would have won the World Cup over the last four or five years. Because we are masters at tacticians, ta uh, at working out the tactics. Why? And you might not think that because we're, we're a nation born of conflict. And we do that. Mark, um, thank you. Uh, there's lots more, but I'm not gonna show you. Yes, there's no need. Um, that's where I come from. Uh, take what you need, take what you think's relevant. I hope there were some bits in there that will uh, make you think about how you look at players. Uh, where football's leading? No idea. I've no idea where we'll be in 10 years' time. No idea where it's going to go in five years' time. The only thing is, I know that kids are kids. And players are players. And they will have the same issues all the time. And if we can deal with them, those issues, then we'll get the best out of them. Thank you, boys.